also the train sheet. The train sheet or the saltador uh, or this fault. And the Palomares fault that is someone here that I'm not going to go in deep during this, this presentation. So what is the main point actually? What is the main criteria to look for uh, all the appliance or hyperspectral camera in, in paleoseismology? I think, as I told you, is to have a, a studies, a previous studies. I think I, I always show this picture that actually is the main point of my PhD. Here you can see this horizons B and C that are not clearly faulted uh, by the false number five and number C. I think it changed completely the history and the fault behavior and everything. So that's why it's really important to know the fault behavior, uh, the, the studies, uh, previous studies regarding fault behavior and paleoseismology. Also in, in hyperspectral uh, in mineralogy, it's really important to have contrast. So if we don't have contrast in terms of mineral size, in mineral uh, and also a grain size, it's not so easy to recognize. And also the how complicated it is to open the trenches. So we went there, we, we use a hyperspectral camera, the ISA Phoenix 1K, that actually is normally used in airborne missions. So it's a big camera, so that's why we have to open a kind of swimming pool, a pit of 10 meters by 10 meters a square. So to put the camera, so it was a really time consuming and of course machine and money consuming to open these trenches. We opened three of these pools. Uh, it's really important actually to know the, the relationship between the, the, the distance of the camera towards the walls that actually will affect at the end the pixel resolution. There we did the normal paleoseismological trenches, logging, uh, georeferencing and so on. So this is the camera. So this is the ISA Phoenix uh, 1, 1K. It's a post brown camera that actually collects all the uh, spectral continuum from the visible uh, towards the shortwave infrared in 2,500 nanometers. So we have about 600 uh, spectral bands. Every band is unique in terms of absorption features that can be related with mineralogy and so on. So this is a heavy camera, about 30 to 40 kilos. So all the HIF team uh, was there helping us. So it was a really interesting data collection. We also collect about 100 samples to use uh, the spectro radiometer, the portable spectro radiometer. And we prepare or uh, we uh, process all the information using the highlight open Python toolbox. So, uh, it also was really important actually for topographic correction to create the uh, the models, especially 3D models. We also uh, brought there some LiDAR scans and we did some photogrammetric. Uh, here are some examples of one of the outlaws just done by photogrammetry, by LiDAR. It was it is really important because to do the topographic correction, it is really important to know the proper location of the camera and also uh, the, how is the incidence of the sunlight against the world. So that's why it's really important to know the topography, uh, to do the topographic correction and so on. So here is the example. This is the, the, the trench for Octavi. So if you can see here in the, in the Octavi's uh, trench, this is, a, this is an outlook that is La Tercia. We have Mars in the base. We have some several faults that affect some uh, alluvial fans. Uh, so here it is digitalized and things with more detail. If you see, this is the, his interpretation. And here the idea was to check the camera. If we are seeing these faults and, and if we have difference. So if you see here, I think the main difference is, is the, the alluvial fan C2 and C1 uh, and also some faults, especially in this area. So this is the photogrammetric model or La Tercia, uh, La Tercia Trench. This is the main interpretation, the main interpretation as Octavi did and also as I did in the field. This is more or less the interpretation, just we check the faults, the anomaly, uh, the stratigraphy, and so on. And here we can have the, the first images. Actually, with the hyperspectral camera, we, we can use several uh, transfer and filtering of the spectra. And with that, we can have some band ratio. For instance, we can have a this band ratio that actually 
can help us to see the carbonates or so the abundance in, carb in carbonates. This is a relative abundance, but you can see here in yellow that we can have more abundance. And for instance, we see here in the base of the Mars, that is a difference that is not clearly seen by the NAKI. So I plot all of the, all of the uh, band ratio image against the, the interpretation. And so many things, especially here in the base, uh, are new, are not seen. We can use another uh, band ratio like the Gibson Gibson uh, ratio. You can see here a kind of ledger on the base and the rest of the image actually is not so clear at all. It's kind of noisy. Again, we plot again the, the interpretation. Here we have the iron, the iron uh, band ratio that actually shows so many interesting stuff. For instance, the fold is very clearly seen here, the main fold but we can see other stuff regarding the composition of all of the alluvial fans that we can correlate at least the, the provenance of the region are more or less the same. So here is the interpretation using the band ratio. Also, we can use another uh, filtering and transforming like the principal components, minimal well lane or minimal noise fraction. This is kind of techniques that you normally use in hyperspectral imagery. So weekly a false color image. And if you see here, actually, there are so many things. If we just uh, put the image uh, against the wall, against the, the photogrammetry wall, so many new things that can be clearly uh, clarified. For instance, the fall is very clearly seen. We can see the bedding. But here towards the right, there are some faults actually that in this image is better seen. For instance, here in the right, I don't know if it's, if, it's, if you are seeing it, especially here, here in this part, and also some faults that by the naked eye are not so clear, but using the hyperspectral camera is, is clear. So using that, this is a new interpretation. You can see that using hyperspectral camera, we can get actually a, a more detailed results. We can have some hyperspectral faults, as I call it, uh, because actually we need to check properly in the field about it. And this is another example that I'm working on. This is another 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 fold. This is the fold over here. And you can see here another uh, minimal noise uh, fraction image. Uh, the fold is at least is clearly seen in this area. So just to finish, so the idea is to work and the next step is to 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 create a upper a hyper cloud, trying to put uh, the hyperspectral data into the point clouds and trying to to work in machine learning and and some automatic mapping mapping so that's the idea so i think this is i hope my time is is okay so this is more or less what i've been doing so far so i'm working in all of the worlds more or less doing the same so thank you thanks a lot john any question for john um yes we will. oh maybe yeah maybe student want to do ask question first <laughs> no don't worry okay so no. I, I was um in the the method you present to analyze your uh, hyperspectral data uh, so you have shown some using mineral mineral index or some um, uh, automatic class uh, uh, big, uh, band ratio using a PCA or something like that. You you didn't mention uh, a supervised classification because it, it seems obvious as you have access to the to the to 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 the ground truth to 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 do that. But uh, I, you didn't mention this um, this approach. Why you, you didn't choose to to do that? The supervised classification. Yeah. You mean? Ah, yes. because no, that's the idea actually. So. We are now in the process of uh, actually of cleaning all of the all of the data and correcting and processing. But the idea is to use actually the end member uh, as a spectra and then mixing actually to have the supervised classification. So that's the idea. I think this is a general uh, first uh, attempt actually. But the idea is to use that. So that's that's the that's the, that's what we want to do in the future. And what? You didn't say what's the final special resolution of your image. Super important, actually. Yeah. That's why uh, I say, I, I told you here, 
that is really important actually uh, the distance between uh, the camera and the wall. So the camera position and the wall. So with this camera, actually, we can have uh, in a wall at 10 meters, uh, the image resolution is about four millimeters, four millimeters pixel. So it's a four millimeters pixel. So uh, we also collect for this another uh, optical really far away, I think is this one in the back, about 90 meters uh, far and the resolution changed for about six centimeters. So, okay. so the actually the relationship just to know the resolution of the of the of the image uh, is really important to know the distance or the camera position, or and also the covering of the post room actually, because the image uh, uh, vertically is one thousand sixty eight pixels. So this it doesn't change actually. So the changing is by the by the past brown and the camera position by the distance. Okay, and, and if you have a supervised uh, classification approach, if it's four millimeters of pixel size, it will be a bit tricky maybe to to get the the mineralogy composition at this resolution. How you will deal with this? This is it's, this is a, a actually a huge problem because we're, mainly we are working in alluvial sediments. So we are now properly working in a rock or where we have a, a, a clearly differentiate a mineral mineralogy. So we have a mixing spectra. The majority is a mixing spectra. So we can we, we try already with some uh, end member spectra and at least in some optos for instance in this one uh, with the high with the iron uh, is kind of uh, useful actually if you just I can show you quickly, or maybe later I can show you, but using the identifying the iron spectra uh, is clearly is easy, but others, for instance, the white mica, uh, the dikite, and other minerals are totally a mess actually. So this is pretty complicated. So I still don't know how to 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 go properly in the mineral classification and mixing. Just I'm working in using the image uh, without. Uh, knowing properly the mineralogy so far yet, just to proper uh, properly see if we are uh, collecting well the falls and we are seeing if we are seeing any new falls, uh, if we can classify a better stratigraphy and so on. Thank you very much. No, no, you're welcome. Any other question? Um, yeah, I have a question. So if I understand correctly with this camera, you're trying to detect smaller scale structures that we cannot observe just with the eye. And what do you, in the end, hope to infer from the structure or what can these um, tell you about, I don't know, what you're interested in? Well, yeah, sorry that I maybe didn't get the, the beginning. What is sorry for that. So what is in the end your goal? What do you, or can you learn from these smaller structures that you can detect now with this new uh, camera? Ah, of course. I think it's really, uh, there are so many features uh, regarding tectonics, regarding faulting that are not so clearly seen actually by the naked eye in the field. That using the camera uh, help us actually to better identify the faults. And with that actually, we can go again to reinterpret the the earthquake horizon and trying to see if the faults are affecting the horizons that we are expecting or maybe the younger one and the older one and at the end we want to date you to to use uh, a radiocarbon dating osl or whatever method that can be applied uh, to know the the earthquake history of the of the area so that's the main goal actually because okay. because the area has been studied a lot, so the area has been studied a lot by several PSD and so on. So we have a lot of data. So we want to check if the high perspective camera we can see more. So that's the summary. Okay, cool. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, Yes, very nice presentation. Thank you. Could you go to the figure that you were just showing? Of course.
because I'm I'm looking at these faults, right? And I'm I'm wondering what we how we should interpret Have you seen this one? Uh, um no the the colorful one uh, the your uh, last one uh, yeah. yeah many of them show but you see many separate faults so are exactly. these part more of a of a flower structure exactly or is this um each a different earthquake on a different fault did it slip aseismically or seismically there's many questions yeah that yeah, yeah. so many yeah i <laughs> and totally actually i go with you with all of the questions this is actually i i haven't gone really on detail but as octavi uh, the previous uh, PSD that work a lot in this area, he identified at least, I think, uh, as far as I remember, six, seven earthquake events, the younger uh, about 10,000 years ago. And about, uh, it was, the range is between 30,000 and 10,000. So we are looking actually, if we can see a younger one. So this is a strikingly fault. This is the main, I think, kinematics of the Alama de Murcia fault. Mm -hmm. So that's why in some of the branches uh, are clear, are clear for instance, in one area, uh, I, I, just on the top of the of the trench, but it's kind of difficult sometimes to follow in at the bottom of the trench because it's due to the <laughs> defaulting. So, so yeah, there are so many questions about it, but I still haven't, I mean, yeah going into the details but that's the idea at the end to check properly if what Octavi has done is accord with what, what we are seeing now the, the new point actually the new point at least in this range I think I want to show you at least this one this is a new one this is a recent one and here the the huge questions is if the fault maybe is not so clear by the by the image so, Maybe by the image is not so clear, but oh. but there is a fault here. This is a reverse fault. This is the strike slip, but this branch actually has a reverse component. So we are not clearly we are not sure if the fault is affecting this white this layer that here is in green in the hyperspectral minimum noise. So the fault is here. So here we can see the 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 reverse faulting of these four two faults, but it's not so clear at least now that is affecting the the younger uh, sediments that is i think dating in less than the less than 3000 so there is a still so many things to do actually so at at what depth do you think these faults are formed Ooh. i have i don't know i don't know proper i don't know about the the proper depth but i know that all these faults in this, this shear zone at the end, according to the models, uh, goes just by one, by one single fault just at the bottom, at least in the Lama de Murcia fault. Okay, so so the, they are part of a flower structure. Exactly, it's a flower, it's a, yeah. it's a positive flower structure, at least in this area. If mm -hmm. we can just have a profile here, uh, the alluvial fans are totally faulted, uh, and the distance here is just, yeah, in one in less than one kilometer, we can have five, four, five branches, more or less. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so would you then expect that some of these faults rupture at the same time, or have you identified candidates that you think ruptured at the same time in the same earthquake? According to what I've been what I've been reading actually about the area about some of the data here in the points number one and three uh, they consider that is most there that now uh, the faulting is more active in the frontal area actually so it's more active it's kind of distributed but it's more active towards the frontal so this is i think what i expect that to have a more active in this area but here the orthos are already closed so that's what we are focusing now actually in if we are seeing a younger events that actually were shown here in the frontal fold, but the Octavius uh, PSD, if we are trying to correlate this deformation also here in the in the south uh, branch of the Lama de Murcia fold. Okay, cool. But I think can be ruptured uh, altogether. I don't know. I will say at least at least in the 
in the front, the, the, this tree, you know, the north and the south, and what is among all of them. Maybe the frontal is different, yeah, but I still don't right. have idea. But this is a different scale than your faults, right? Totally, totally. Yeah, like you, exactly. your, the, the small faults you show are one of these lines. Uh... Exactly, exactly. I just want, I just, if you see here, the number one is la, tre, is la tercia. This is, is this one actually, yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's one line, but it's a flower structure actually, yeah. Okay, so looking forward to see your results and yeah, discuss uh, how we can use them in November. Thank you Hopefully, very much. Yeah, that's it, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thanks, John. Interesting. I, I think we can move to Macon. Can you share your screen? Uh... I think so. I hope so. Can you see my screen now? Yes. Oh, uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Perfect. Um, so to remind you, my project is uh, combining Wait, there's a bar in the way. Um... Oh, okay, never mind. Um, so combining INSAR and seismic go models to understand earthquake sequences in complex fault systems and applications to the central Apennines. Uh, currently, I'm working on the modeling part. Um, where I'm trying to create a realistic instantaneous model of the central Apennines that can reproduce the observations uh, to eventually investigate the importance of the different driving mechanisms in the region. I, I started with two end member models, one where there is no uh, Moho overlap, as in literature it is suggested that in the central Apennines there is no uh, double Moho observed. So that's why I designed the left model. And then uh, second, there is a model that does have plate overlap and both have a detached slab um, as is observed in the tomography. So first the results from the uh, left model without Moho overlap. Um, first, what you can see in this left figure is the deviatoric normal stress, where blue is compression and green is extension. And as you can see here in the unzoomed figure, the um, sinking step imposes a compressive stress field at the surface. And uh, here I show the sinking velocity of the slab, which is around five centimeter per year. And on the right, I'm showing a zoom of the deviatoric normal stress, where again, green is extension and blue is compression. And in red, I showed the coastlines of Italy. And my model only shows a very small area under extension. Whereas uh, in Italy, we observe uh, a, large, um, a large region of extension. My cross section is uh, located here. And as you can see, almost half of Italy is under extension. Whereas in my model, um, almost everything is under compression. So this is um, not yet what we are looking for. Then in the second model, here I again show the deviatoric normal stress. Um, and here we do get a larger area of extension. And this um, area of extension um, is induced because of the uh, positive buoyancy of the lower crust, which is, well, here you can see it better. This is a plot of the density where the lower crust has a lower density 
um, than the surrounding lithosphere. So there is a positive uh, buoyancy and the crust uh, moves upward out of the subduction zone. And this creates this area of extension. Um, but still, as you can see, there's here a big patch of compression and here as well. Um, so it is not exactly what we observe yet. Um, then I also tried a model with an attached slab because there is still a debate going on whether there is um, a slab window under the central Apennines or not. And um, what we observe in this model is still an area of extension, um, but also a large the the amount of compression seems to have increased with larger magnitudes. And in the downward velocity, you can see that there is a large subsidence going on here and uplift in this region. And we do not really observe this subsidence if we look at the, for example, the GPS velocities, which you can see here. Um, there is no clear a subsidence on this side of Italy, which um, the attached lab model would predict. And then here you can see the INSAR velocities where green bluish is subsidence, um, but there is no clear large scale substance going on uh, near the Adriatic coast. Well, that is what the attached model um, predicts. Um, so there are some mismatches between my model and uh, the observations, of which the first one is um, that the observations show a clear horizontal extension of three to four millimeter per year. And I've not been able um, to produce this in my model yet. Uh, furthermore, all models show some substance near the Adriatic coast, and this is also not um, observed. And then there is a lot of compressions in the models, uh, which is not clear from observations. Um, most of Italy seems to be in their extension. So I've been thinking about what maybe we are missing in the models. And the first um, thing is slab rebounds. Um, I'll show you here. Here on the right, you can see a model from the Alps, uh, a model that has shown that has modeled the long term evolution of first starting with straight plates, then subduction, and then slab break off. And that model, you can really clearly see that when the slab breaks off, um, the remaining, the remnant part of the slab moves back up. Um, and that is something we don't have in our instantaneous model because we start with the slab already like this. So there's never this elastic energy stored um, of bending the slab because the slab was already bent. So we also cannot capture um, the slab rebounds in our model. Um, so we are thinking of maybe trying to um, impose a a stress structure in the instantaneous model so that we can create this slab rebound. Um, and then other possibilities are to impose uh, a horizontal plate velocity in the model um, that can pull um, that can pull the plates apart. Um, however, this would imply that the extension is driven by external forces that we're not able to capture in the model. Um, and third, um, there might be a larger scale mental flow that we don't um, generate in our model. So uh, my next steps are to play with, with the rheology of the lower cross to study its effect uh, on the observations. I want to run models where also the upper cross subducts because now I usually only have the lower cross in the subducted slab and not the upper cross. Then I want to um, run models where I impose an extensional plate velocity. Um, 
and maybe if this is all not generating the results that we are looking for, um, the idea is to impose a stress to create slab rebound. Um, and that was it. Okay, thanks a lot. Any question for Maika? Yeah, hi. Uh, thanks, Bruno, for taking over. <laughs> no worries. I was on duty. So, uh, okay. Um, Mikey, uh, I'm sure, I mean, there, there, there have been other people investigating this. So, I mean, uh, um, so previous models, uh, were they able to uh, reproduce um, the state of uh, stress that we see in, uh, in Italy? And how did they do it? Um, there are there are no large scale models in the in the in the central Apennines. There is one model in the northern Apennines, but there um, the slab is faulty. We still attach, so you don't have this problem of um, the slab rebounds. You um, and for the rest, there are no um, larger scale models in the central Apennines. So that also makes it. Harder because the lithospheric structure, for example, is very poorly constrained, and there's not a lot of uh, information about the deeper structure. Yeah, this is very surprising, right? I mean, there's a lot of research done in Italy there, and a lot on the tectonics and the geodynamics. So I figured there must be models because they can help you argue if the slab is attached or not and stuff like that. But it's not. There, there's a one three-dimensional model, but that is the slab doesn't attach detach where we think it does. So that's an, a rough approximation because the models aren't even there. We cannot even compare to the stresses. Right. So there's a lot we can learn with these models and many things we can add to that general understanding of uh, the geodynamics there. Yeah. But uh, we also slowly start to realize that that is uh, it's maybe not that easy. <laughs> yeah. No, it's less easy than uh, we thought it would be to reproduce observations. Yeah, because there are a lot of components you can add or suppress or you know yeah. change parameters and things like this. So uh, so it's basically a trial and error approach, I guess. Yeah. Yes, yeah, but the moment... observations. Uh... Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, with the velocities on the surface and the seismicity and, and the things we change do have quite an impact on that. So mm -hmm. should, I guess, be possible to to make some some nice contributions there. Very good. So all you have, all you have uh, on the kinematics is just GPS, I guess, and uh, and uh, local mechanisms as well, and things like this. Is so. I mean, what what are your uh, constraints? So, um, I mean, in terms of yeah, the so kinematics, yeah. I'm comparing against uh, GPS and insular velocities, and also focal mechanisms uh, and seismicity. Um, and we also want to compare against gravity anomaly, uh, the Bouguet anomaly computed for for the model as well. Yeah. But then it's not kinematic. No, no. Generally, yeah. Mm. It's all driven by gravity in our case. Uh... So that's the yeah, so of... at the moment, I'm also not imposing any velocities. It's all driven. Uh, inter by internal forces uh, in the model. But one of the next steps would be to impose this plate velocity. But then that would also imply that is that it is that the extension is driven by a by an external factor. No, I mean it's nice to have a pure, I mean, dynamical model, like mm -hmm. you, you know, so. Hmm. Yeah, also, because we see quite large variations in the stresses, also a depth. So if you want to skip this step, I wonder how you then would parameterize uh, an earthquake model while still capturing the, the loading uh, correctly. 
So something to discuss also with the people that, that will do that. <laughs> yeah, because I mean, this information about earthquakes and, and GPS is very, you know, shallow and, uh, you know, so yeah. Yeah, that's why with the double moho and the detached slap or not, I mean, these are things that are intensely debated for a very long time. No one has tested them, so it's interesting. Yeah. Yeah, Italian can debate quite a while. <laughs> <laughs> Bruno, do you have any ideas on the Italian geology dynamics there? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, we we have some connections uh, that we that we uh, will talk to. Mm -hmm. All right. Thanks a lot, Mike. Are there any other questions in any case? All right. So if no, um, then I guess, Bruno, uh, it's time for you to uh, teach us, you know, new things. <laughs> Let me share my screen. It's asking me something here. Ah. Ah, okay. No, it's working. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. It's okay? Yes, it is. Okay. So, yes, I, I hope uh, to say something new and uh, maybe for someone it's not really new and uh, Something has been uh, given us uh, some information by by Marco, by Una, and Celine. But in any case, the idea of this presentation is to give you an overview of uh, seismic hazard assessment, in particular, uh, probability seismic hazard assessment uh, models that can be uh, produced using uh, together geology and seismology. So geological and seismological data together to improve our our models. So my idea is I organized the, the presentation through in three main steps. We have an introduction uh, with a short background seismic as analysis, uh, and then some ideas about seismic source characterization and then characterization of quick rates and rapture scenarios. So we start with some definition just to to know the basics when where we start. So what does it mean to do seismic hazard? Seismic hazard is uh, the estimation of expected ground shaking in a particular site uh, over a given period of time as uh, consequences of earthquakes. So it's uh, physics characteristic of the territory and uh, can be defined uh, using uh, two main ingredients that are the Geology, the geological information, and the seismological information. Uh, we are interested in sources that can give uh, ground shaking that, that is uh, of uh, engineering interest, of course. Because the, the second step, the step uh, that uh, is uh, after the seismic hazard the definition is the definition of the seismic risk where we have, uh, together with the hazard, also exposure and vulnerability information. So we need to, so to see. see. Okay. We have to characterize the consequences in terms uh, of structural damage to buildings and infrastructure, and the consequences in terms of facilities, fertilities and economic cost. 
And so the, the, the presence of structure and people and the property of existing uh, that's to be imagined for this ground shaking have to be taken into account. And uh, in this presentation, we will concentrate only on seismic hazard, but of course we have to remember uh, uh, the, the, the step that uh, will be done uh, mainly by engineers after that, because it's important to, to understand what we need and why we are concentrating in some aspects of the, uh, of the, of the process. Uh, if we talk about seismic case analysis, uh, we have, uh, in a classical approach, we have uh, four steps, four steps. Uh, the first one is the identification and definition of earthquake sources. So we have a site. I don't know why I, I'm not able to see my... What's wrong? So, okay, my pointer, my pointer. Yeah, yeah, we can't see it either. Okay. We do without, okay. <laughs> so we have the site where we have to evaluate the seismic hazard. And then so around this site, around this site, we have to define uh, the sources of uh, potential ground shaking at this site. A ground shaking that could be interesting uh, for uh, then the aim of the seismic hazard uh, model. So we will see that we can define sources in a different way. We can uh, recognize uh, an individual and a single fault. Uh, we can identify a, a fault that have uh, some uncertainties in, uh, in geometry. We can identify another source that they can be defined as another that have uh, seismic a seismogenic uh, homogeneous potential, and or we can define some point sources. That means uh, uh, point where we expect to, to have the uh, epicenter of an earthquake, and then we have to evaluate the ground motion expected by each point. Uh, the second step is to define for each of these sources, and we see for each rupture, we expect from each sources the recurrence model. So the classical magnitude frequency distribution of the earthquakes that uh, are uh, given by each source. Then we go in the ground motion models or a ground motion attenuation because we know that from the sources to the site, uh, we have an attenuation of the ground, the ground shaking and we have to evaluate how much is uh, this attenuation, and of course, uh, uh, we know that the ground motion models have uh, some uh, uncertainties, uh, quite large in some uh, in some cases, and so we have to treat with these uncertainties. And then, uh, so then, the last step we have the outputs, and the main output of uh, uh, seismic hazard model is, is a seismic uh, is another curve. Is not only a value, but it's a curve that gives us the probability of exceedance of different values of the ground motion. In this case, in this representation, we have acceleration, but of course, we can have any other ground uh, We will concentrate here in particular in a probabilistic seismic casual modeling, but we have to know that there is also the possibility to evaluate uh, uh, the seismic hazard in a deterministic approach. Here we can see just uh, with few words, I want to say uh, the differences between uh, in a classical deterministic approach. The, the main difference is that in the step two, after we recognize the, the different sources uh, in an area around the site that we are interested in, then we have to decide the fixed distance and the fixed magnitude. So we have to define what we call the, uh, the controlling earthquake or the design earthquake on the side. So we have decide we have to decide which earthquake uh, we are interested in, and uh, so for which earthquake we want to evaluate the expected ground shaking or motion in the uh, side. 
So the, the, the first step is the same uh, because again, we have to go into the uh, ground motion models, uh, but uh, the, the main problem in the deterministic approach that uh, we have no possibility to trade with the uncertainties and we know that uh, we will see how many uncertainties we have in the source definition. Uh, it's quite, it's more easy to understand how many uncertainties we have also in the ground motion and motion models. Uh, so the, the first step, uh, the how to have a deterministic approach is uh, to have just a, a fixed value, the fixed value of a ground motion would be the peak acceleration, the displacement of something else, but we have just a value that is uh, 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 the value that is shown of the controlling earthquake, you know, the sign earthquake that we decided to use. So the problem is uh, how to choose uh, this uh, reference earthquake. Uh, usually, towards some years ago, we, we can find a reference uh, to the worst case, but the problem is uh, what does it mean worst? Because it depends on the on the interest in on the site. We will see uh, uh, about uh, uh, comparing different uncertainties so how can change the results uh, the, in terms of uh, uh, expected uh, ground shaking. Uh, why? Because we have to define, uh, uh, and it's difficult to define uh, the earthquake rupture, because for each, uh, also if we decide to uh, define only one source, in any case, uh, for each source, uh, the earthquake rupture is not easy to, to define. Each, uh, uh, every earthquake is different to the, the previous one, and we know about that. Uh, the variability of the ground motion intensity, we know that, uh, again, each earthquake uh, uh, is uh, different to the, the one before uh, in terms of uh, ground shaking and uh, ground shaking distribution. And uh, in terms of seismic risk, also the variability of impacts, for, for sure, it's, uh, it's something that is important. Uh, before we, call, we we know that we call this uh, reference earthquake as maximum credible earthquake. Uh, now in the the last years uh, we call more maximum considered earthquake because it depends on the interest and how we we have to uh, we we how we decide uh, this uh, reference earthquake. Uh, how. How is the impact of this decision now? Is large uh, uh, these uncertainties we can see just uh, looking uh, earthquake by earthquake what's happening. Uh, in particular, if we concentrate on the variability of ground motion intensity, here we have the example on the 1993 earthquake in Taiwan, and uh, we can see by the recorded ground motion here we lucky to have so many stations that recorded the, the, the ground motion. Uh, so starting from the same source, and uh, we have, this is one earthquake, so we know that uh, uh, the rupture is that one, but uh, at the same distance, we have big differences in, in terms of uh, pin ground acceleration. At, uh, uh, for example, uh, more or less 10 kilometers, we have uh, values that are around 0 0.1 uh, to, uh, to 1 G at the same distance. So uh, this kind of uncertainty is said to be considered uh, and uh, could be really important and, uh, and could be, uh, can have a big impact on the results in terms of seismic hazard. In particular, when then we use uh, these values uh, to design a building or an infrastructure. So uh, it's important, uh, and in particular, uh, usually we use a probabilistic approach because uh, we can treat all the uncertainties uh, we have, uh, trying to reduce some uncertainties. But in any case, uh, it's important to evaluate and manage this kind of uncertainties. Uh, the big difference is that uh, we have to remember that uh, uh, we have not only one value when we use a probabilistic approach, but we have uh, a ground motion as a group. That is this uh, 
uh, object where we have uh, the ground motion versus uh, the probability of accidents. And we have to remember also that we are more than interested in the low rates of accidents. So it's not the worst case because uh, uh, what we know, we will see later, we will discuss about this later, that uh, the large earthquakes are less frequent than the, 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 the uh, minor earthquakes in some way. So we are interested in uh, magnitude that are more frequent uh, because we are interested in the ground motion that we expect uh, in a, a time a window that is the time window of the light of our building so on in flux structures. And uh, the other problem is that uh, it's not easy uh, to do a validation of the, of the Tesmic Hazard models because direct observation of this group is not practical. And uh, we need to uh, have many, many earthquakes that cover uh, different ranges of magnitude and different uh, uh, sources and uh, to cover all the possibility that are managed into, into this, uh, this kind of models. How we obtain this curve, uh, uh, how we, so we construct uh, our models, uh, we have to, Evaluate uh, how often earthquakes happen on new resources, the, the source around our area. And then uh, we have to evaluate the resulting ground shaking going into the ground motion models and combine uh, the, these two main steps. Numerically, we have this kind of curve. And uh, I want to focus mainly in this presentation in, on, on the first point, how often earthquakes happen on every source and how we use, uh, usually we define uh, the sources and the expected uh, seismic threats uh, for each sources. Uh, we know that uh, usually the, the seismic hazard models are presented by uh, seismic hazard maps like this one for uh, Europe. And uh, we have to remember that these colors uh, are only the uh, the plotting of the points uh, that represent uh, uh, one probability of accidents. In this, uh, this case, uh, the typical 10% of accidents probability in 50 years. So it's uh, one point on, on our curve uh, calculated for each point of the grid, uh, uh, the, the grid that uh, represent uh, uh, the distribution of our calculation toward the, the, the entire Europe now in this case. Just a simple example to understand how it works at probability seismic hazard assessment uh, modeling is quite easy. Uh, then we will complicate everything, but uh, the, the, the approach is more or less uh, this one. So we have a site, uh, we have uh, two possible uh, rupture in this example. What we have to evaluate is the annual occurrence probability for each rupture. Uh, so, for example, we have 0 0.05 for the rupture one and 0 0.01 for the rupture two. And as uh, you can see, is uh, less the probability for a larger uh, rupture and uh, it's more frequent to the other one. Uh, then we have to evaluate the the ground motion. So again, in a probabilistic approach, what we can have is a table like this one on the, on the right. So we have the probability of, to have uh, different values of uh, big ground acceleration, uh, in this case, uh, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, or 0 0.3, to, for the different rupture. So for the rupture one, we can have 0 0.8 uh, uh, for uh, 0 0.1 or 0 0.18 for uh, uh, 0.2 G, or 0 0.02 for 0.3 G. And uh, uh, it's different for the rupture two. Uh, again, uh, as you can see, the rupture one uh, is smaller, so we have more probability for the lower value of PGA. The rupture uh, two is larger, so we have uh, uh, a different distribution of probabilities for the different values of PGA. 
so if we want to compute the annual probability to have uh, a PGA equal to 0 0.3, or we have to, we want to evaluate the probability to have a PGA larger or equal than 0 0.2 G, what we have to do is uh, just uh, do 0 0.05, that is the probability of the rupture rule, uh, one uh, times 0 0.02, that is the probability to have uh, for the rupture one uh, 0 0.3, and uh, plus uh, 0 0.01, that is the probability of the uh, to have the rupture two times uh, 0 0.2, that is the probability to have 0 0.3. For this, uh, for this rupture, and final results is uh, this 0 0.003. Uh, this is the, the same uh, if we want to, because usually we don't want to have the probability of uh, a specific value, but we are interested in values larger than a value. That is, uh, for example, the value where uh, we decide to design uh, our building. So our building can resist uh, between 0 and 0 0.2 G. So we are interested how, how frequent and how, how, is, how, how much is the probability to have uh, a ground shaking a big ground acceleration that is larger than 0 .0, 0 0.2 G. And so we do the same. We use the probability of the rupture 1 times uh, the probability to have 0 0.2 and plus the probability to have 0.3 and the probability of the rupture to uh, times 0 0.4 that is the probability to have 0 0.2 for the, uh, the rupture two and uh, plus 0 0.2 that is the probability for the rupture two to give uh, an acceleration of 0 0.3 and this is the, the final values we obtain uh, sorry uh, we do this uh, for different uh, uh, values of uh, big ground acceleration, and we obtain our uh, uh, hazard curve that can be obtained uh, uh, one by one for each source. And summing them in terms of probability, we have the, the final hazard curve that is the one uh, more high in this graph. Formally, this is the classical equation of the probability seismic hazard models. Uh, so we have uh, the uh, uh, probability, the lambda, the, the, the rate of uh, an intensity measure larger uh, on the value that uh, we are referring to. And, uh, and so we have uh, what we have to evaluate is the probability to, uh, to have uh, uh, an intensity measure larger than value using the ground motion model. Uh, for each individual rupture, uh, where for each one we can consider it or not the site properties, and uh, uh, that has been evaluated uh, times uh, the uh, the lambda, so the uh, the occurrences, the recurrence of uh, uh, events for each uh, seismic source, so for each uh, uh, rupture, for uh, we can expect, and uh, of course uh, for each site we have to consider all the possible rupture that can give uh, these uh, values of uh, intensity measure larger than than one around this. A few words about uncertainties. Uh, we have two main uh, uh, family of uncertainties. We have the epistemic uncertainties uh, from the Greek epistem that is related to the knowledge. Uh, so it's referred to our lack of knowledge about uh, the state of the and uh, so we can in some way reduce this kind of uncertainties uh, improving our knowledge of the process so more uh, we learn about uh, uh, the earthquake process more we can expect uh, to reduce these epistemic uncertainties but we have another part of this relatory uncertainties uh, from the latin area that is the game of dice that uh, usually refer to, to random outcomes from the natural variability in 
process. So means that uh, each event is different uh, from the previous one. And so this variability has to be considered and uh, we cannot uh, uh, reduce this kind of uncertainties, but what is, is necessary to do in a probabilistic approach is uh, to try to better uh, understand and better evaluate this kind of uncertainties in order to uh, uh, manage these uncertainties in, in a correct way. Uh, we know that the source of ground shaking aside can be uh, related not only on earthquake faulting, but also in other primary source, uh, than external or mixed, but we are interested mainly in earthquake faulting because are uh, also the sources of the most important uh, uh, ground shaking and also because uh, uh, are the more complicated to be evaluated in uh, uh, we know also that the source of network uh, uh, is not only a point, but is something that is complex because there is a variability in uh, space and uh, in time. The source of a network is a displacement along the fault and the can be seen as function in space and time, X and T, that generates a field of displacement within uh, a time interval uh, t uh, taken by the rupture to propagate around along the fault. This is an example. This is the 1992 lambda slip model. The, the, the rectangle is the, the fault. So we have more or less 15 uh, kilometers in depth and uh, 80 kilometers in length. And uh, the different colors means the different uh, slip that uh, uh, were produced by the headache. Of course, it's not uh, totally instantaneous. Uh, so uh, what we need is also to consider time in this uh, kind of rupture, because we know that uh, the rupture move uh, from a uh, point that uh, is the more weak uh, maybe point of the fault, and then uh, there is a migration of the fault. So this is only the the, the photography at the end of the process. So it's something uh, quite a bit complex. Uh, uh, and uh, also uh, there is, uh, of course, an uncertainty uh, related to the randomness of the process because the next earthquake, maybe the, the, for the next earthquake, maybe we have a photography that is uh, a bit different than the, of this. Uh, why it's so complex? Because we know that earthquake is uh, uh, related uh, to the geological and structural process. And we have uh, several uh, control factors uh, that uh, are the tectonic regime and also the uh, stress level in the lithosphere. Uh, we have the thermomechanical properties of the lithosphere and uh, of the fault zone, and we have the geometrical characteristics of the fault uh, and uh, the kinematics, uh, and uh, different kinematics, also the different uh, velocity of the formation uh, velocity. All these parameters can change uh, uh, the results in terms of, of, of source. Uh, we know that uh, the, the rupture stuff uh, we in an hypocenter, that is the nucleation of the rupture, where the rupture start, uh, and then uh, we have the migration of this rupture that is more or less with the same velocity, uh, about uh, more or less three kilometers per second. But then uh, at the end, uh, we have uh, uh, different distribution of uh, uh, full displacement, uh, and different dimension of the source, that means different uh, ground, ground motion produced by this uh, earthquake. We know also that we can have uh, some uh, structural complexities that uh, can stop or not stop some uh, uh, migration of the rupture. So can uh, give, uh, can be a barrier or not, uh, uh, for a, a rupture and uh, can give us uh, different results in terms uh, of uh, magnitude and so expected uh, ground motion. We know also, I said something before, that uh, we have to consider also the different uh, frequency of the earthquake. We know that uh, events are less frequent, uh, uh, 
slower events are more frequent. And uh, we know that also we have some relationship between them and the good and the relationship is something that we have to consider. And, uh, and so um, in a size, in probability seismic as an approach, uh, maybe we are concentrated more and not uh, so rare events, but we are more interested in the events that are uh, more frequent uh, in the time frame we are interested in. And uh, which ingredients we can use to, to produce our models? Uh, we have the earthquakes, and so we have the earthquake catalogs uh, that could be instrumental, uh, in particular uh, in areas where uh, the earthquakes are more frequent, uh, because obviously if we want to produce uh, uh, some way a forecast model, a model that can give us an idea on the rates of expected that fix, so we have to, uh, to start from a catalog that is representative of uh, a, a certain amount of uh, occurrences that can be used then to uh, uh, obtain uh, 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 an expected rates that are an expected rate that are more or less close to the uh, real. Of course, uh, where uh, uh, the deformation is uh, is slower, where we have uh, uh, the events on the uh, magnitude that we are interested in that are less frequent, we can uh, use also different catalog, for example, the historical catalogs, uh, uh, for example, for the probability seismic cancer models in Italy, the historical catalogs are really important because can give us uh, uh, more information than uh, the instrumental uh, earthquakes can give us, in particular for magnitude that are larger and uh, in terms of engineering interest, and so to produce uh, uh, ground motion more interesting uh, for the, the modeling. And uh, we have a good, uh, really good. Uh, catalogs, uh, historical catalogs in Italy, but of course we have to manage carefully because we have a lot of uncertainties uh, in this kind of catalogs that are different, are larger and different than the instrumental ones. So we have to know how uh, uh, this kind of catalogs are produced, which kind of information we have. We have to remember that uh, we have uh, for many of these earthquake no instrumental uh, measures, uh, so the magnitudes uh, we have in the catalogs are magnitudes that are evaluated in an empirical way, starting from uh, uh, intensity data points distribution. Uh, and also and so also the uh, attribution of each of these earthquakes for a specific uh, source uh, can be more complicated than uh, uh, instrumental earthquakes where the uncertainties in terms of uh, uh, Center position is, uh, of course, less, and also the evaluation of the magnitude is more correct. In terms of uh, ingredients that can be used to produce uh, information useful for probability and mechanical models, of course, we have also the the active faults. So, active faults database is another catalog that can be used. To produce uh, rates of earthquakes that are in the interest of uh, of uh, our modeling, we we will see something, and we will see something more about uh, the importance uh, to organize in the correct way. Also, an active fault database that can be used for uh, seismic hazard models. Uh, so as we said, the uh, uh, probability seismic as assessment quantifies the probability of exceeding, uh, exceeding the specific levels of ground motion at the site, given the range of possible earthquakes during a specific period of time. In a classical Poissonian approach, uh, the probability is given uh, mainly by this lambda value, that is the number of events uh, that uh, have the uh, evaluated or counted starting from the, the catalogs in a uh, range of time. So it's a very a simple approach. But we know 
in the last years that uh, uh, they use uh, the geological data as input for probably seismic hazard models uh, is improving uh, more and more as now is quite uh, uh, diffuse and common for all the models. Uh, and uh, why it's important? Because uh, uh, we can uh, give more information in our database uh, so uh, we can go back in the past uh, more than uh, where I arrived old, so the uh, historical catalog. So we can, uh, in terms of statistics of uh, occurrences, we can go back in time, but also we can uh, use uh, uh, more the information about the sources uh, uh, because we know more the characteristics of the sources. One step that is important to know that is, is also that uh, using the geological, uh, so uh, active force information. Uh, uh, we can uh, move to, from a uh, classical questionnaire approach, where, uh, as I said, uh, the lambda values is only the number of events uh, uh, evaluated for a range of time, versus uh, time-dependent models, where the probability of occurrence of the next earthquake is also related to the uh, the lapse of time from the last one or the last ones occurred in an area. Because we know that uh, uh, we have in some way to renew the, uh, uh, the amount of stress in an, uh, in an area before having the next earthquake on the same on the same source. We know also that this more complex uh, the, the, the all the phenomena, but uh, is uh, uh, is a, is a step that we can uh, manage and do only uh, using also geological approach. Uh, so we move uh, quite fast to the seismic source ca uh, characterization. Uh, remember that uh, in a seismic hazard model, the seismic source uh, identifies all the potential earthquake capture scenario that can generate ground motion of uh, engineering interest. Uh, so we define, uh, usually we define uh, a distance that is more or less between uh, 100 and 300 kilometers from the site. That depends uh, in the, on the amount uh, of the magnitude uh, expected. And uh, for each rupture scenario that is generated, for, uh, for each source, we define uh, a different rupture scenario that is generally represented as uh, rupture uh, high and uh, for each rupture high we have to uh, to evaluate uh, the rates of occurrence of the uh, of each rupture so the lambda value for each rupture so we have the source for each source we have to define all the possible different ruptures for all the different ruptures we have to define how how frequent are these possible uh, uh, so how we are the expected rates of occurrence for each rupture. Obviously, the definition of the force is, uh, is the same we use uh, in, in seismology and uh, in tectonics. Uh, so we have to decide the, the, the geometry in terms of strike, depending on the direction, and we have to decide the, the kinematics, uh, the classical kinematics. Uh, few words about uh, how it's important and why we say that we can move from um, Poissonian model to time-dependent model using uh, uh, individual and, in general, geological sources. Uh, the idea started uh, in the first of the 90s, uh, after the San Francisco earthquake in 1906, uh, large ma uh, magnitude around eight that destroyed uh, the San Francisco city, but where we also were observed the rupture in surface uh, that uh, show to the receptor of the, the period that was clear the, in the connection between the ground motion and the, the uh, tectonic sources, uh, so the, the faults. But in particular, uh, uh, they did uh, uh, some uh, uh, observation, import, uh, important observation related to, uh, to the fact that they had some geodetic observation uh, to time windows before this earthquake. 
and uh, the displacement uh, uh, that uh, uh, was measured after that, like, through the observation of the object uh, crossed by, uh, by default, uh, uh, they found a correlation between the, the, the amount of stress that uh, had been produced before the uh, earthquake without uh, uh, instantaneous rupture on the, on the, on the individual's fault, uh, and then the observation of the rupture after the, the, uh, the earthquake. So uh, from this, uh, the, uh, we have the elastic, classical elastic bound theory of ride, uh, 10, when uh, we know that uh, after an earthquake we have the fault that is located, then we have uh, a movement uh, with the uh, relative velocity on the two sides of the fault. Uh, and then uh, we have, when we arrive to a threshold, we have the, the, the rupture in a weak uh, point of the, of the fault. And so we have this location that is the one we are interested in because it's the one that is more instantaneous and produce our grain shaking. But uh, what is important on this uh, elastic bound theory that is in terms of technical value is that uh, in some way we have a periodicity of this process because we need to uh, reaccumulate uh, the elastic uh, deformation on two sides of the fault before having the event on the same. So in some way, if uh, uh, we evaluate the deformation that is going on on the two sides of the uh, a source we can evaluate where we will land on the next earthquake. Uh, we know that this is really more complex than the, the system because we have a correlation between the different faults that are not alone, but uh, we have a correlation between them. But it's an important starting point uh, uh, where then we elaborated the models that we all uh, stick slip models, uh, classical represented by a rigid body and the spring uh, and the mass that uh, the resistance on the sliding surface uh, due to the, to the contact uh, between uh, the surface and the mass. And uh, we know also, as I say, that uh, all the sources uh, can be interconnected between them. So the, 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 the system is complex and the occurrence of an earthquake, uh, uh, in this case of a movement in a, in a source close to the another can change all the process. Uh, one explanation, uh, the possibility to use this kind of inter earthquake interaction is, uh, for example, the Coulomb stress uh, changes. Uh, we know that after an earthquake, the, the Coulomb stress values around the source that uh, ruptured and uh, produced the earthquake uh, change. Uh, and so if we have other uh, sources around the one that ruptured, the probability uh, to uh, new earthquake can change in terms of uh, positive or negative change can be anticipated or anticipated. And uh, this is a classical example where we start from classical uh, ride uh, model, and then we have an anticipation of the, the earthquake uh, that is related to, uh, to uh, a positive uh, increasing of uh, Coulomb stress change. Uh, as I was saying before, it's uh, really important to organize in a correct way the information about the, the faults, uh, uh, exactly. For this reason, I was saying uh, before, because uh, the, the faults are not alone, uh, are quite complex in surface. We have seen before in the presentation of John, uh, if we, more we go in detail and uh, more complex. And uh, we see that we can uh, subdivide uh, what is uh, a simple source uh, in a seismic hazard model in different, different, uh, many place. And uh, we have to understand how to organize this information. Uh, in particular, if the main aim is the 
to produce uh, pole bases as we can find now. So because the primary data are the traces, uh, and then we have uh, to connect these traces uh, to understand uh, how to obtain fault uh, or how to obtain main fold that uh, are the, the possible sources of ground shaking that we want to uh, reproduce. Obviously, uh, uh, the main message I want to give you is that uh, we have to be, uh, it's, it's important to be connected and to, re, uh, to have the uh, correct report in, the, in each database of the primary data. Uh, so uh, each one want to model everything uh, uh, can do uh, in a different way, uh, starting from the primary data, the target data, and uh, uh, putting together the data, producing different possible rupture scenarios uh, doing different hypotheses, but uh, uh, not uh, uh, guided in some way or, or by the choice of, of the uh, database compilers. That uh, it's important that give uh, the primary data clearly reported in the database. Uh, in this example, the, I think I can go fast here. I just to say that uh, we did. Uh, this database a few years ago in the Central Apennines. Uh, this database uh, is important that in, in this database is not the, not only the geometry, but this uh, point by point where we have the information. We have the slip rates uh, values that uh, can give us information about uh, the, the velocity of the deformation and so the near recurrence time of uh, each event. Uh, we will see why. We need this uh, and uh, and also the slip rate variability toward the, the structure of the fault can give us some uh, ideas also about the uh, segmentation model can be used or not used. Uh, for example, uh, in this case, we show how we can model the different data in terms of slip rate uh, uh, to obtain the slip rate profiles along the seismic source and that can guide in some way the, the source dimension that can be used in, in our models. And uh, we, we tested the, this uh, impact, uh, in particular the impact of the slip rates uh, uh, because uh, the main faults we have here are divided into distinct uh, section of length comparable to the seismic check that to all consideration, all the variable slip rates. And so to explore in some way the possible multifold capture in the computation, because again, as I said, we are interested to, to have the, uh, uh, the different rupture, but the different rupture can, uh, we can have uh, uh, multi rupture on different faults, uh, also on different uh, sources that are uh, quite close and uh, they can uh, in, in have a in, uh, possible interaction that can be taken into account in some way. Uh, and so here we see the results in both in the terms of seismic hazard and also in the seismic risk because uh, very, very simple, uh, it's just a probability of collapse for a single historical small edifice. But what is important is uh, uh, the message here was uh, also that we, uh, we explored the, the impact of the slip rate evaluation uh, in terms of results. And now we know that maybe it's more important to uh, to improve our knowledge and so the, to reduce uh, uncertainties in terms of uh, slip rate evaluation uh, than the ge real geometry of the fault, <laughs> because the impact of the, the correct evaluation of the slip rate is quite high. In some cases, we have not so many information about that uh, in other uh, more, and uh, they about the, the impact in terms of uh, seismic cuts and seismic risk could be really, really important. Okay, and also we did some tests uh, uh, on the uh, multifold impact. Uh, so to use uh, uh, this interaction uh, is uh, is uh, is really important and uh, and have a big impact in terms of results. Uh, we see some other examples on that. Uh, 
characterization of earthquake rates and actual scenario because uh, uh, now we say something about uh, the seismic source characterization so only the geometry and uh, the different values can be assigned to the uh, different geometries uh, but uh, uh, before obtaining the, the results we have to, uh, to evaluate how many earthquake we expect for each source uh, and how are distributed the different rupture scenarios. In particular, uh, remember that the seismic, uh, we have to remember that the seismic source model uh, uh, typically combine different types of sources representing the probable location of uh, future earthquakes. And uh, it's quite easy, it's more easy, not quite, it's more easy for a for source, so for in the, in individual sources, uh, it's more complex, uh, is uh, is with more uncertainties we, we can say that uh, for an area source where we have no idea how will be uh, the the rupture uh, we have to model uh, there is the possibility to to model different possible ruptures that can explore the different uncertainties also in terms of uh, of geometries and not only on, on the uh, the most obvious representation of a seismic source is a fault. Uh, so we start from the observation of, uh, for example, here in the Apennines, we can recognize uh, we are quite lucky because uh, more of the, many of the uh, active faults are exhumed on the, on the Apennines. Uh, and so we can recognize, we can elaborate uh, in some way, uh, uh, a segmentation model, and we can represent uh, different individual sources uh, that are three-dimensional surface uh, that represent, in some way, the zone of weakness of the of the, of the, of the surface, uh, over which uh, uh, earthquakes occur, and uh, these occurrences uh, will, will be modeled. Uh, so for each source, uh, we have to we can uh, in the, uh, define all uh, the geometrical parameters in terms of length, uh, the angles, as mechanic thickness, uh, rake, uh, and also uh, assign the slip rate values so that can give us uh, some uh, possible evaluation of the of recurrence of the events on that, that topic. Uh, one of the problems is the fault segmentation. Uh, because uh, we can choose a model. Uh, we can say that uh, uh, we have some information about geometry in recognizing in surface, uh, step over larger than uh, some kilometers, gap, uh, or uh, also observation in terms of value uh, 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 earthquakes recognizing on different uh, segments. For example, here is also the massage fault zone example, uh, and this uh, different uh, distribution uh, is uh, different information can give us uh, some information about the possible fault segmentation. So fault segmentation means that uh, we can identify the, uh, the mass, the, 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 the bigger uh, rupture that can we, we can expect uh, on uh, each individual fault. Uh, but we know that uh, we had some events that uh, didn't respect, uh, didn't follow this, uh, these rules. And uh, so we have to consider uh, uh, models that, that will be more complex than this one. In particular, uh, we have uh, a few events uh, in, the, in the last years, uh, Central Apennines 2016, but in particular the Kaipur earthquake that showed us how the segmentation model we had before were uh, not correct uh, for these uh, events. And, uh, and so we have to understand uh, if uh, our segmentation models are too, too simple and uh, we have to in some way relax segmentation models uh, towards uh, different complex eruption models or uh, these events are all, only some uh, black swan that uh, maybe we have no possibility to consider in our probabilistic uh, approach. 
for sure, we know that we can consider, um, we know more about the, the interaction between uh, different faults, so we can explore uh, these uh, unsegmentation models. Uh, and so we, uh, we can uh, do what we call uh, literature uh, for segmentation relaxation. Uh, we know that in a classical definition, the characteristic earthquake is a fault model whereby faults or fault segments generate earthquakes of a characteristic size, and that is function of fault length and tectonic setting. But we know also that maybe the system is more complex, and so we have to go uh, versus uh, uh, model that are more complex and consider the possibility to actually different uh, faults, different fault segments. Uh, uh, and uh, we have to live in some way this uh, characteristic uh, model. We had uh, in literature different, uh, uh, several, we can say, models uh, that consider this uh, fault segmentation relaxation. Uh, one important example is uh, in California with the use of uh, models where, the, where relaxed segmentation and multiple rupture via generalized inversion approach is used. Considering and using different information on both models, deformation models, and quick rate models to arrive at the end, the probability models. Uh, we have some other models also, for example, here in the research for system, uh, some years ago, we did uh, this test to test the impact to use or not use. Uh, uh, segmented approaches on a fault system. And we can see that comparing the results using a segmented or unsegmented approach uh, diff, uh, using our, uh, from other inputs such as sleep rates and microscale relationship, I like that segmentation acts as a primary control on seismic hazard. And so it's really important to explore also this uh, kind of models because the impact could be really, really important. We did, uh, I think I go fast here because we are uh, quite late. Uh, um, we did uh, some uh, tests also using different approach, uh, Sheriff, uh, Fresh, Sunfish. Uh, I can give you some literature to study this uh, on uh, Northern Apennines, uh, South Apennines fine chain between Italy and Slovenia. And we see that the different impact of different segmented versus unsegmented, but also different unsegmented approaches that use in a different way, the same data we have could be, uh, can have a big impact in terms of expected uh, ground, ground shaking. And so a big impact in terms of uh, seismic hazard. So we can say that the, the fourth to fourth, so the, 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 the model that consider uh, to uh, move and leave the segmentation models uh, in a, a enables the community to operate in a, the necessary paradigm shift from the individuation of earthquake rupture barriers along single faults to the characterization of fault for fault to fault rupture and fault system. That is a step that we have to, to do, that we are doing in the last years, and we 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 have to explore also in in, in our project. Uh, applying this methodology to enter fault system allows us to capture large numbers of possible rupture than a segmented approach, and the, the, the progressive cyclical are models reflects more closely the actual fault system geometry and estimated the sleep rate distribution. Uh, how we can evaluate for each rupture uh, the expected seismicity rates? Obviously, we use the seismological data uh, we have. Uh, so we have to do this step that this earthquake source association. We can use if we have all the seismological data we have. We have to do uh, to use the relationship we know between uh, source dimension, so the rupture dimension we are modeling and expected that quick magnitude uh, using scanning relationships, and uh, and then we have to choose uh, uh, magnitude frequency distribution that could be. Gutenberg-Richter, characteristic earthquakes, or a hybrid model that uh, put together two different approach. But in any case, the steps are. Uh, uh, 
the data that we have uh, so to associate the seismological data, the uh, historical data, the paraseismological data to our rupture uh, sources, uh, and then evaluate the possible uh, dimension of the next earthquake using the geometries, and then choose uh, the, the, uh, the microfrequency distribution. And so we have to move to what we call a seismogenic source model to what we call earthquake rupture forecast. Uh, how we can evaluate these rates? We have three main families of uh, evaluation of uh, rates of occurrence for rupture scenarios. Uh, seismicity based approach, geological approach and earthquake simulators. I will give you some details about uh, the first two, seismicity based approach and geological approaches. Uh, I think we we can discuss uh, really a lot about uh, the possible uh, uh, use of earthquake simulators in uh, probabilistic seismic hazard models where we will have uh, the next uh, workshop in, in Netherlands. In uh, so, uh, seismicity based approach, uh, we start from uh, earthquake data and that can be instrumental or historical, and we choose a minute frequency distribution. Obviously, we choose in, after and, uh, an idea of uh, this distribution looking into the catalogs, and then we, we use this minute frequency distribution. Uh, uh, the different geometries and the different uh, rates that then, uh, sorry, the different uh, rupture and then for each rupture we give uh, uh, the rates. Obviously, uh, also in a seismicity based approach, if we have full data, we have to use it and compare, for example, where we have to decide, for example, the mitre frequency distribution, uh, if you use uh, we use a classical Gutenberg-Richter uh, uh, model, and then we have uh, uh, the possibility to truncate our Gutenberg-Richter uh, and we finish to a magnitude that could be defined also by its full data. But because for example, uh, if we have an idea of the maximum uh, uh, rupture is a, a, a boundary of the maximum possible earthquake, maximum possible magnitude. Uh, in a geological approach, uh, we have the, the full data. Uh, so we have geometries, we have the magnitude, and again, uh, we have the possibility to calculate the rates of each magnitude uh, uh, using uh, uh, information that can be uh, given by the slip rates that uh, can be the, defined by geological observation, but also by ge geodetic data that can help us in this evaluation. And uh, with this approach, we can uh, evaluate it also in some way with the expected uh, sleep for each scenario that uh, again uh, can be evaluated using uh, uh, also uh, seismological information together with the geological. A seismic data, so it's an input uh, uh, that have to be used uh, to both the seismicity on geologic or the geologic based approach for estimating rupture rates, uh, to calibrate the statistical models representing rates of future rupture scenario. Uh, databases of past earthquake activity first need to be compiled. So we need our catalogs. Uh, the data may come in the form of historical reports of past events uh, without information on instrumental data. Uh, could be also geological evidence for occurrence of events. Uh, Paraseismological information uh, is uh, one of this uh, kind of data that can be used, uh, but also can include also instrumental record events if we have. Uh, the amount of information within a given the database can vary in a big way and will depend on the source of the data uh, is historical, geological, or instrumental. Uh, obviously, what we have is uh, the origin time of the event, the percentage location of the event, and measure of the size of the event. These are the three main information that we need 
where uh, we have to constrain from CCDCD data the, the expected CCDCD rates. Uh, we have to assign this data to the sources. Uh, could be uh, complicated or not, depends on the kind of data. Obviously, again, we have uh, good data, so for the historical one, it could be easier. Uh, if we have um, few data, it's not uh, so easy, and so we have to consider the uncertainties. Uh, so you see here also the location and error uh, are given in terms of probability, the geometry can be uh, uncertainty. So we have the probability. Again, the slip rate uh, can be uh, probability. And uh, so everything can be treated in terms of probabilities. Uh, this is a table that is uh, just an example of uh, uh, assignment of earthquakes to earthquake sources. Uh, uh, just a few words to say that uh, uh, what is a point uh, uh, is only an epicenter in a historical catalog uh, is uh, a distribution of intensity data points. And it is important to know that uh, when we assign an earthquake to a source, so we have not to see only the uh, epicenter of uh, the, the event in the catalog, but we have to, to see the intensity data point distribution and uh, we can uh, we have to use this kind of information to assign to different sources this kind of data uh, about the paraseismological data just few few words to say that uh, uh, where is the earthquake is more easy because we evaluate directly in uh, in surface uh, the occurrence of a, a rupture event uh, the problem is to evaluate uh, the magnitude of this event. Usually, we use an uh, uh, empirical relationship that uh, are related to the uh, slip per, per event uh, value and then we assign uh, an expected magnitude. But also, the, the, the timing of the, of the events uh, is not so easy because we use different uh, uh, approaches uh, that evaluate the date uh, of the uh, uh, of the sediments that are involved in the rupture uh, but uh, each uh, dating method uh, uh, can have some uncertainties uh, we published the recently a paper where we try to create these uncertainties in terms of uh, uh, chronology of uh, events in particular, thinking that maybe we can use this kind of data again to explore uh, a segmented default model that uh, consider the possibility to, uh, to have uh, models that uh, have different uh, sources that can be uh, interconnected to be between them. Recurrence time of, of events, how we can evaluate this uh, Mean recurrence time, uh, we can use, as I said, the, the, the slip rate uh, using, for example, an approach proposed by field voters in nine uh, that divides the seismic moment uh, to, that correspond to the maximum method by the moment rate uh, giving uh, slip rate. Uh, we have to remember that we, we have to consider what we call uh, in CV, so the coefficient of variation of this mean recurrence time. It is uh, simply the standard deviation of the recurrence times over the mean. That means uh, how much is regular or periodic the event or not, because it's something that can give us an impact in uh, our probabilities uh, of uh, the next earthquakes, in particular when we move uh, from uh, Poissonian models, so Rationality process uh, where uh, the uh, the lambda, the rates, uh, as I said before, is only uh, the number of events uh, uh, over the uh, the time window we are interested in. This is time dependent model where uh, uh, we can consider uh, the uh, memory of the last events. Uh, in the territory, we have. Uh, many uh, examples of time-dependent seismic hazard models, uh, in particular concentrated where we have only exclusive, uh, exclusive memory of the last event. So what we call, uh, is called in statistics is a simple renewal approach. 
uh, classically we have uh, different uh, possible uh, uh, probability density function that can be used uh, in uh, usually the one typically used the time dependent for basis seismic as models is the Brian passage time probability density function that is the first one here but also in this kind of uh, function we have to consider uh, CV value the coefficient of variation called alpha for the uh, BPT distribution uh, and uh, here we can see for example on the right uh, how changing the alpha value the uh, probability density function change uh, in time changes the, 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 the shape on the on this point. The, the BPT, the Brown Passage Time uh, Probability Density Function, means uh, that uh, we go uh, close to zero just after the occurrence of, uh, of the event, uh, just after the earthquake. Uh, obviously, the probability to have an X1 uh, just after is very low, it's close to zero because uh, uh, it just happened, so we need time to uh, uh, reaccumulate uh, the stress. Then uh, we increase the value. Uh, and then uh, we move, uh, uh, we decrease uh, quite uh, very fast if the alpha value is, uh, is very low, or we go toward a Poissonian approach, uh, random process if the, the coefficient of variation is, is high. Uh, we have uh, some examples uh, that use uh, this change of probability in terms of renewal process that. Uh, change the probability of an except to make uh, on depending on the lapse time from the last the last earthquake uh, this uh, example an example from central Apennines using uh, a segmented uh, model and uh, here we see how can change uh, this is this picture uh, show only the differences between a Poissonian approach versus a time dependent one it's, uh, were produced before the L'Aquila earthquake, uh, so the, 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 the probability was uh, quite high in the L'Aquila area, but also in the Sulmone area. And then uh, if uh, we produce this kind of map now, it's, uh, it's different because uh, we had the, the events uh, in the L'Aquila area. Uh, going back on the... Uh, uh, new data we are observing now, we know that the complexities are all, not only in terms of segmentation, but also in terms of time, because we can have uh, clustering, uh, synchronicity, we can recognize uh, uh, to the seismological data also what we call that quick storms that uh, give us uh, uh, an idea that the, the system is complex and uh, we have this uh, Correlation between the ports. I go fast uh, toward, the, toward the conclusion to say that uh, we did some tests uh, uh, in central uh, Italy again uh, to see the impact of this uh, uh, possible interaction. Uh, starting from the 1950 Fushima earthquake, that is the largest one we had in Central Apennines, around minus seven. And uh, if we see the impact on in terms of uh, uh, has changed and considering also the viscoelastic relaxation, we see that we, we had an impact uh, in terms of uh, 0 0.3, 0 0.4 bar for the L'Aquila uh, center that uh, can suggest that maybe uh, the process of the all the events we had from uh, Ushino earthquake, then we had the, the Corfiorito earthquake, uh, then we had the L'Aquila, and then we had the, the Central Apennines 2016. This uh, uh, process uh, can be in some way related to a long process that, uh, that suggests that these different events could be correlated between them. In particular, if we consider also the post seismic, so the viscoelastic relaxation, we arrive to values that are quite large, it's uh, 0 0.6. Five bar is the impact of uh, the fusion earthquake on the L'Aquila. Uh, um, the L'Aquila source, in uh, There is a, a less impact for the central Apennines, uh, but uh, again, not, uh, could be not uh, transcurable. Mm. 
we can say in particular that the magnitude 7, uh, 90, 50 in co-seismic plus the post-seismic, so the viscosity relaxation, form size change, have a big impact on the stress evolution in Central Italy. And uh, potentially that quick cascade uh, is this uh, cascade events uh, is potentially still ongoing. And so we have to, to understand if uh, we have to consider or not uh, this uh, kind of uh, uh, data in our in our we can use uh, interaction in seismic hazard models uh, using uh, the Coulomb stress changes because we can change uh, the mere recurrence times of the events, uh, considering a trigger or a delay in, in the events, uh, changing the mere recurrence time of the lapse time from the single, the last events, uh, and considering also the Coulomb stress change on point of the point. Uh, okay, the last slide that I uh, want to use just uh, for discussion, a few conclusion. Uh, my question, my question is the unexpected is because uh, it's less probable or our model are too simple. And uh, if are too simple, we have to understand how to improve our models. Uh, Remember, uh, we started uh, from simple uh, ideas on how is a seismic as a model because we have to remember where we have to live. So uh, we have not to enlarge uh, too much the complexities because then uh, we are enlarging our uncertainties. So we are not able to manage in a correct way of the uncertainties. Uh, for sure, reality is more complex than models. Uh, and so for definition, our models are wrong, but we have, it's the best we can do. And it's, uh, it's something that uh, can help us to manage uh, what uh, uh, will happen and how to design uh, the best way is possible our buildings and our structure. Uh, for sure, we need to include the interaction and segmentation relaxation to form basic seismic and models and different approach that will arrive also from this uh, third project can help uh, us in this, uh, this way. And uh, it's also important uh, to collect and organize in a good way the, all the observation, seismological or geological observation. For example, sleep rate variability over time is something that can give us really uh, some, uh, some important data that can be used in models. And so remains a fund uh, fundamental challenge. So thanks a lot. And uh, I hope uh, we have, uh, you have some questions. I have problem to listen to you, David. Can you listen to me? I cannot listen to you. Hmm. I don't know, maybe I have to try to go out to the... So we I... hear you, we know, but we, I don't know, we cannot hear David. No, I, I listen to you. Maybe it's David, the problem. Yeah, I think David has a problem because we cannot hear him. Ah, okay. Okay, is that better now? Yes, yeah, we hear you now. <laughs> Good. Sorry about that. So, um, yeah, I don't know if there are any questions. So that was a question. You'll just put on your mic and, and ask uh, Bruno your question, if you have any. I mean, I, I have one for to start with. Um, so you mentioned uh, about segmentation. So I guess segmentation is directly linked to uh, Mmax. 
So, um, um, so I wonder, I mean, in the end, how do you decide about NMAX if, you know, uh, the segmentation is accounted for or is purely statistical? Uh, it's both. Could be statistically uh, obs observation of the occurred events, but if we have an idea of the geometry of the sources, we can constrain some way using uh, uh, what we know about the empirical relationships uh, between the, the, the dimension of the sources and the possible maximum earthquake. And in some way, also, if we have uh, uh, this problem of segmentation, but we can have constraints by the, by the seismogenic thickness, because we know that in any case, we can have the relationships uh, on the aspect ratio. We, we cannot expect uh, 200 kilometers of uh, rupture uh, with the seismogenic thickness of 15 kilometers. So in some way, we can constrain also using uh, 3D uh, geometry of the of the sources. Okay. I'm not so sure about, you know, 200 kilometers versus 15 kilometers, because, I mean, the San Andreas can break over 200 kilometers. Yeah, I was thinking, uh, yes, <laughs> uh, I was thinking mainly on uh, reverse on normal faults. So, yeah. All right, okay. It's yeah. more uh, for sex sleep, maybe I can say 500 kilometers versus 15. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yes, for sure. But in any case, again, uh, we have seen that in Kaipura is... Uh, Something is outside our knowledge we had before about these mm. relationships. So the idea now in the probability seismic hazard models is uh, uh, to give um, some way the possibility of each man. Uh, you have to weight the probability. So maybe it's possible also an event that is in some way unexpected, but we can model giving him a very low probability. Hmm. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Any any questions? Anybody? Everybody but must be tired, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> I can understand that. I mean, yeah, I mean, I mean, your lecture was very complete, and um, uh, thanks a lot for this. Uh, so it's it's been recorded. So I, I don't know. I I had problems with previous recordings because I couldn't find them and put them on the YouTube channel. But um, I hope uh, we can do with this one. Yes, I did. Yeah. So yeah. Then I will send you the, the record. Sure. So any questions, anybody? That would be good. Nope. Tired. <laughs> I cannot... <laughs> All right. Okay, so maybe we can stop. It's nearly six o'clock. Oh, it is six o'clock, actually. So, um, so thanks a lot, Bruno, again. Thanks. So the next speaker will be Guillaume Daniel from uh, Elec Electricité de France, EDF. And uh, it has seen two weeks' time, if I'm correct. Um, and uh, the program is not finalized yet uh, for this year, but uh, we're working on it. Yes. Right. Okay. And uh, we will update all of us also for the next workshop we will have in other months. Okay. Very good. All Thanks. right. Thanks a lot, everybody. Yeah.